Yeah. Thanks, Ken. You're good. Welcome, everybody, to this week's uh, or this month's Zoom panel. Um, our host, John Meredith, has some a great lineup of speakers who have been through um, how to scale to the sweet spot. Uh, they're experts in our industry and in their businesses themselves. And John, I got to thank you a ton for all the extra work that you've done hosting these meetings and putting them together. And the industry absolutely owes you, uh, is indebted to you. And we owe you a big thank you. So thank you very much. Oh, thanks. Enjoy. Thank you, Jasper. I appreciate the opportunity. It's really a blessing to kind of give back. And uh, I heard a friend of mine said, you know, you learn and then you earn and then you give back. And so that's, uh, so I love to give back. I love this industry and I love everyone in it. So it's it's a pleasure to 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 be able to host these, and I really appreciate the opportunity. But today we've got an amazing panel of guys, uh, two guys I know pretty well, and uh, we're going to talk about how to scale to your sweet spot. When we did some surveys, a lot of guys were saying, you know, I'm a one truck operator, and I really would like to get to a multiple truck, um, you know, operation so I can kind of get out of the field, and so I've asked Chuck to join us today because Chuck uh, Roy House, who's also president of the CSIA, uh, is probably one of the best operators in our industry. And Chuck also has a consulting business called the Roy House Effect. And if you need some help getting your arms around, you know, the back end of your business, I would highly recommend that you contact Chuck. Um, he's he's got he's. Oh, it's funny because whenever ever I want to know some metrics about our industry, you know, I usually call Chuck, and he can he can model it pretty well. So uh, he's got a good handle on his numbers. And so Chuck doesn't work in the field, but Chuck's, he scaled his business to three trucks. And he runs a very profitable business. So I wanted to get, kind of have him on today, kind of share some of his thoughts and processes and strategies that he used to kind of find that sweet spot. And then also Mark Stoner's with us today. Many of you know Mark. And uh, Mark scaled his business to 30 trucks. And so he, he also runs a prof profitable operation. And, and uh, so I thought those guys could, you know, if you're a 10 truck operation, you're looking to grow, or if you're a one truck operator, you're looking to grow. I think this is a place to be. Also, I will tell you that a lot of the webinars that we've done in both the Survive and Revive and the Survive and Thrive series, which is what we've been doing, um, are all kind of paramount to leading up to today. So if you haven't watched those yet, please go back and watch some of those other webinars, you know, the hiring, the culture, the, uh, the last one we did, you know, they're on pricing, all those will kind of help you get to this point. So with all that knowledge that from the previous webinars, it kind of gets you to where we are now. And now we want to help you thrive and find that sweet spot that you feel comfortable with. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Chuck, I know you put together a little PowerPoint. If you kind of pop that up and, and, and share that with us. And then, so today's, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're just going to have a nice discussion around growing your business. And uh, so I would encourage you to use the chat box or the question and answer feature on the, on the Zoom platform. And we'll just have a great conversation and get into, you know, we want to answer a lot of questions that you guys have. And just, we're going to have more of a dialogue. And uh, but I want to Chuck to kind of go through his, you know, cut, just to get us started here, got to go through some of the things that he found uh, really critical to helping him get to, to finding his sweet spot. Well, thank you, John. Thank you for the fine introduction. And thank you again, as Jasper said, for hosting all these events. And you've been doing a great job for us. And I can't thank you enough on a personal level and on, you know, being speaking for CSIA. We definitely thank you. Um, before we start the PowerPoint, I want to give you kind of a, some background or context, uh, how you want to think about what I'm going to be talking about today and definitely what Mark will be talking about. Mark has not shared with me what he's going to talk about, but I know Mark very well and I've been to almost anything that I can go to to see him speak, so I kind of know where he's coming from. So there's a lot of crossover between what I profess and what Mark believes as well, and it doesn't really matter about the size of your company. So I want you to think of it like this. Running a business is like baking a cake. There's many ingredients that are required, but it's a strictly followed recipe. And, that, and strict, uh, if you follow the recipe strictly, it ensures a tasty result. So what do I mean by that? So if you don't know anything about baking, baking almost always calls for a pinch of salt. And then your eggs might have to be at room temperature. And you want to have softened butter to cream, which means you can't microwave the butter and turn it into a liquid. It doesn't work. So you've got to follow the directions. 
but every one of those ingredients, it's like a chemistry project and you have to follow it. And who would have ever thought, you know, these things were so important. Well, that kind of crosses over to these business principles that you need to do all of these. Another thing to think about is learning from other people's mistakes. You know, you don't need to be a pioneer right off the bat. Okay. It's nothing wrong with being an innovator and doing your own thing. But if you're trying to be organized and getting your feet off the ground and maybe expanding, if you're already organized, don't be a pioneer. Pioneers are always recognized by the arrows in their back. That doesn't want to be you. And then thirdly, you know, do you know why I always attend anything that's a Mark Stoner talk, even if it's a repeat? And it's not just because he's the chimney Jesus. We only retain about 20% of what we hear at any given educational outpost, whether you're reading it, whether you're hearing it, whether you're following slides. So that means there's 80% of this information that if you think you've heard it before, you need to hear it again. You will always pick up something new. We never stop learning. And lastly, your attitude. You've got to believe you are a winner. Uh, run your business regardless of its size, like it's a Fortune 500 company. You want to shoot for Mars, and if you only get to the moon, that's not so bad. I learned that a long time ago. In the mid-'90s, we had a convention in Atlanta, and there was a speaker, and he was talking about your business being like a bunch of links of chains in a circle. And every one of those links were important, and that's how McDonald's is modeled. And I figured, you know what, that's not a bad person to model yourself out of, because if I'm only half as good at McDonald's, that's pretty darn good for a small business. So with that, I'll start the presentation. So hey, Chuck, before you I, do, I want to interject mm -hmm. something, too. You, you have to think of yourself, uh, I think if, if you're a one-truck operator, I think, you, you know, what happens when you get in business, you have kind of a... Uh, entrepreneurial seizure and you start a company right and then you realize well hey there's all this other stuff you know i got hiring and firing and marketing and sales and you know when when you were a great technician so a lot of what i see is a lot of business owners let's say you're a great plumber but now he starts his own business and all of a sudden he finds out there's all these other disciplines involved so i think you i think you need to make a mental shift from being a technician to being a business owner i think that's mm -hmm. one of the first steps that you have to make because a lot of us get into this thing, we're great technicians, and we want to be great technicians, but you have to really make sure that you in it, uh, you have to, when you, when you get in business, and, and you know, if you want to be a technician, and there's a lot of great, just one truck operator technicians, there's also a lot of guys out there that want to get from being a technician to being a business owner. I think that's what this webinar is about today. Oh yeah, without a doubt. And this is where you go from being a one truck operator to having two, three, four, five trucks. So you have to lay a foundation, just like if you were digging a foundation to pour a footer to build a big chimney on. The footer's got to be the starting point that's done correctly. So where do you start with that? Well, I like to start with training and education, and I believe it has to be continuous. You have to reinforce it, but there also has to be an accountability mode. You know, there's a lot of platitudes that people will talk about and they'll throw around terms or you'll read things in books and it's all good information, but they don't tell you how to apply it. So you need to get into it and think, okay, well, I need to get the right certification. So you go to CSIA, you get certified. Well, that's not the end of it. There's other training you need to know about that's more than just technical. There's business training and we do business training at CSIA. There's outside vendors that can help you with different portions of business training. But the thing of it is, it is always continuous. There is never a one and done in anything that we work in because things change. And the one thing that I've learned being in business almost my entire life, I started in business right after I got into the fire department because I didn't make enough money. So for the last 35 years, I've had either a landscaping or a chimney company. And with that, you know, I've learned that things move very, very fast in the last 10 years with technology changing and how people react to marketing. And it's not like it was so easy, you know, as it was 30 years ago. It's a lot more difficult and you need to stay ahead of the curve. So your training needs to be continuous. It needs to be reinforced. So not only do you need to set the example by you continuing your training, you need to reinforce to your technicians and your helpers that everything that they do is important and they need to follow the script. 
and then you need to hold them accountable. And that's where most people fall apart is they think they can just hand out a piece of paper, an SOP, they can go over some instructions, and then everybody's on board. That will never happen. No one is going to be invested in your business as much as you are. And you will ask yourself, well, why won't he do this? I don't understand. I work until 9 o'clock at night. This is important. Well, the difference is this is your baby. This is your livelihood, and this is your future. You need to create a culture where people have that same vision, where they don't just see their employment as a job, but they have investment, and they're honored to be here, and they're an integral part. So you do that by holding them accountable. It's just like raising kids or training dogs. If you don't have an accountability measure, then the training goes out the window. So that leads us into discipline. So you have the personal accountability. So personal accountability is what are you doing as the business owner? And that leads us into lead by example. So that means you need to be at work one time or actually earlier before anybody else shows up. So when they're showing up at, say, quarter to seven, you start at seven o'clock, you should be here at least by 630. That way you're settled in, you're ready, you reviewed what you're doing for that upcoming day and you're fresh and you got your game face on and you're ready to greet the guys. And when they come in, you get the guys pumped up. You want to follow through that the jobs are completed. That goes back to the accountability piece. You just don't hand out jobs. You hand out jobs and you want to go over what the job description is for that particular job, anything they might need that's unique to that job, making sure that they're ready for it and get them out the door. So another thing you want to do is you always want to build your wealth. So some of this people get confused about. What is your wealth? The dollar amount is not important. It's all about what is personally important to you and creating basically a package that fits your lifestyle. So if you're somebody that likes to do a lot of traveling and jet setting and things like that, you're going to need more wealth. If you're more of a homebody, and you just like doing things around the home and you don't go a lot of places, you might not need a lot of wealth. But if you like motorcycles and Corvettes, you know, you're going to need wealth because they're expensive toys, they're expensive to maintain, they're expensive to insure, and you have to have enough wealth built into the system where you have time off to enjoy them or you end up having a collection of stuff you never use. So your salary must be built into your overhead calculations and you can't just hope for profit. So what does that mean? That means that when you build your budget, you wanna think of it as building it in reverse. You wanna plan it out like you were gonna go on a trip somewhere. And you wanna say, okay, I'm gonna leave the East Coast and I'm gonna take a a trip out to California. I'm not necessarily gonna go in an exact straight line. I would wanna go south and maybe see some places I haven't been before. Well, you would put a map on the table, you would map out the route, figure out where you wanted to go, where you were going to stay, and you would have a plan. So you basically are building the trip in reverse. You know you're going to end up in California to go to Disneyland, but along the way you want to accomplish some things and do some things. So that's how you do your budget. And your budget is a real thing, and it is very important. But it's not the most important thing that you will do right off the top. What is most important to build your budget is to price your business and your services to what they need to be priced for. And that's what we covered two weeks ago with Tom Grandy. That is the very first thing you need to do. And once you have your pricing down, then you can build your budget. And your budget will then tell you what you need to be charging to get to California or to get to that end result, whatever that is. And everybody's goal is a little bit different. Some people are happy working for a salary, and if they have enough money left over at the end of the year and they were able to accomplish their goals during the year, they're happy, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's other people that want to build a large amount of wealth, so when it's time to retire, they can retire and not have to work again. So neither one is a wrong way to go. It's just what is good for you, and those are the things that you have to figure out in your own mind of which direction do you want to head. So that leads you into cash flow. So you never want to exceed your cash flow. The cash flow is your lifeblood, 
of the money going in and out of your business, and it needs to be monitored. Um, I like to look at my profit and loss statement at least on a weekly basis so I know where I am and have a handle on everything daily. And that would be a good way for you to do it. If you don't know how to read a P&L or a balance sheet, some people call it, talk to your accountant. Get them to show you the five most important things you need to monitor weekly. Once you start doing it, it'll become fun for you. It's something a lot of people dread in the beginning. Once you learn the key indicators to look at, it's not very hard, and it'll become second nature to you. It's just developing the habit. So things that you want to look at, you want to track everything. You want to track your inventory. What does your inventory tell you? Well, it tells you what you need to have on hand, but you don't want to have too much of any one thing. You need to know what do you sell on a regular basis. And with today's supply chain, usually you can be supplied in two to three days almost anywhere in the continental United States. So whatever the number of trucks you have, you want to be able to outfit it for maybe two or three times before you have to reorder. That way you have some slack in the schedule that if you're coming up on a holiday or we have some kind of a bad weather come down, ice and snow, or you have a flood, if it's delayed a week, you're not waiting at a crucial time for some kind of supply. So you track your inventory. Your incoming calls, you should know your call count per day. That'll tell you what days and what time of the days are the most busiest. That helps you have the right number of employees answering your phones at the right time during the day. You might be able to find out that the busiest time of your day is between 10 and 2, and you could have a part-time person working to augment or supplement the regular staff that works from maybe 8 to 5, and you don't have to have a high-paying job that really doesn't need to be working 40 hours a week. That's why you want to track it so you have the answers to these questions so you know when it's time to expand and you do it in a logical format. Your marketing. You've got to market, and when you look at your marketing, you need to know what is working. So when you track your phone calls, I would encourage you, if you do it real old school, have a checkoff sheet. If you're able to do it on your computer, you should know where the calls are coming from. You should know how many are coming in per day, and you should ask, how did you hear about us? And there's so many different ways that people are hearing about you, whether it's social marketing like Facebook, uh, Hows, whether it's, you know, Yellow Book, whether you're sending out coupons. You need to know what's working for you, and you need to know what's working by zip code because what will work in one part of your area might not work in the other, and it helps you hone down to know where to wisely spend your marketing dollars. And the same thing applies to your advertising. Where do you want to advertise and what's going to work for you? You don't know the answers to any of these questions if you don't track it. And it's very easy to track if you make the habit of having the people that answer your phone check off a sheet, whether that's manually or whether it's something you do internally if you book online. And the last thing about money is you need to have positive equity on your balance sheet. So you always want to have money that's coming in, replacing money that's coming out, but a profit built in so you have a cushion. So size, that's kind of what we're talking about today. So when I do talks for different places, I always tell them that bigger is not always better. And what do I mean by that? Uh, a large company does not mean you're going to bring in more profit. You could do more dollar volume of business, but that doesn't mean the profit is always going to be there. So you want to remember three things. Your top line is all about your vanity. Your bottom line is what is sanity, and cash is always king. So how do you, how do you work out the size number? Well, it's what you're comfortable with. It's what you're comfortable managing, or the trick is that a lot of people aren't willing to give up control. So as John interjected at the beginning, if you're happy being the plumber on the truck or the chimney technician on the truck, and that's what you enjoy, there is nothing wrong with that. Hire somebody to be a general manager to run your office and to run your crews, but you still need to make them accountable to you. You just can't turn them loose. So find your niche, and you want to own it. So what do I mean by that? Well, your niche is what is it that you want to do in the business? Where do you want to be? Who do you need to help you do that? 
and then find your niche as far as the services that you offer. You don't have to do everything that you could possibly do. You might not be good at one thing or another. If you can't find the right people to help you do it, you focus on the things that make you money. And that's what you market and advertise to, to bring in the right revenue. So you want to focus on what's called the three P's, your profit, your predictability, and you want to focus on professionalism. Professionalism is the name of the game today. That is what is driving us. Um, most of the advertising that comes through in the marketing is social sharing. And it's out there about who felt comfortable and who trusted who. And that is going to be by how professional you handle your clients from the time that the phone rings until your truck gets there, how the experience is on site, and then how your follow-up is with the clients. Is it, is it friendly? Is it interactive? You don't want to be pushy. You want to be engaged, but you want to be helped at all times. So how do you do this? You've got to have systems. So you want to build on a foundation of quality. If you don't have quality systems, you don't have quality products, you're going to get callbacks. Callbacks cost money, and then you get a bad reputation. You want to keep your loyal clients. So you should be, again, tracking who are your good repeat customers. Do they call you every year? Do you have a system in place to have a service plan where you come out and it's expected you're going to go out on a yearly basis? Forward scheduling is one way to do it. There's other plans that you can offer them as far as selling them service packages. All of these work to maintain your market share, and that's what it's all about. You want to have a financial safety net. Um, I was giving these uh, talks, you know, before COVID hit, and I would tell people that they need to have at least six months of a nest egg set aside that you could run your business if anything blew up. God knows I couldn't predict COVID, um, but I knew other things happened, natural disasters, uh, layoffs, people walk out. Um, so I figured six months was a good, you know, amount of money. I still subscribe to that. I now personally have, you know, for me, I like having a year in effect that if things really go bad two or three times in the same year, it's not going to affect me. That's a personal decision. At the minimum, I would say you would want to have six months in the bank in a savings account that's sitting there as your nest egg in case things go sideways again. Hopefully they won't. You want to have your trucks and your toolboxes that are standardized and you want to have them fully stocked. So that doesn't mean if you're running one truck, two trucks, or 30 or 40 trucks like Mark. You want to have a system where no matter what truck somebody is assigned for the day or a helper switches to, if they're going to look for something, it's in the same place. It's the same tool. And the reason for that is that makes you efficient. It's easy to do an inventory to know if something is broken, worn out, or missing. And it saves you time with somebody finding it to bring it back inside for you to work with. Time is money. We heard that two weeks ago. Once you drill down on knowing what it costs you to operate per hour, you divide by 60, it'll scare you what it costs you to operate per minute. And you start losing two or three minutes of time in a year, that adds up to thousands of dollars of lost revenue. And if you're only 10% profitable, which is kind of low, that means for every $100,000 you bring in, you only get to keep $10,000. So minutes that are lost is lost revenue. Don't be that guy. Have standard operating procedures for everything you do. Uh, my company has almost 200 of them in place, and I'm a very small company. But from the time you walk into the door, how you're introduced to employment here, what you watch to get up to speed, how we answer the phone, how we interact with clients, the difference between what a lead technician does and what a helper technician does, it's all spelled out. How we throw a ladder. You need to have all of these SOPs documented, and you want to update them on a regular basis. And the way you want to update them is have your crew involved in updating them. Have them have skin in the game. Have them have ownership because they will follow a policy much quicker and much more to the letter of the law if they help write it because they're going to feel like they were empowered to help run your operation. So that's very key to remember. And you've got to have a culture of continuous improvement at all levels. So you want to hire people and you want to set the example and train them to think we are never going to be satisfied with the status quo. We always want to be moving 
to the next level. The next level doesn't mean necessarily more money or more revenue. It means let's be better. Let's be more efficient. Let's be more professional. Let's help the client or the customer get to what they want in a better way. Financial controls you need to watch out for. You need to know. Um, you need to know your total labor hours. You know, need to know your total labor costs. And then I like to focus on what's called profit for opportunity. So, you know, we all have sales opportunities, but I really want to drill down on did we not only close that, but did we stick to the hours that were allocated and the materials that were allocated so the job was profitable? That's where you get down to the nitty gritty. So how do you do that? You need to know your direct costs, which would be your labor, your materials, your payroll, and your workers' compensation. And then you have to know your indirect costs, which is going to be the overhead, the vehicles, your insurance, and your marketing costs. So how do you accomplish it? If you know and measure your gross profit uh, margin, which is your sales minus your uh, direct and indirect costs. So basically, it's this cake recipe, and once you bake the cake and you account for the electricity to run the oven and all the ingredients and your time and the air conditioning for the office and everything else, and you subtract all that, you should have money left over. And it should be in our industry, 15 to 20, 20%. That is a good profit margin. That's pure profit after everything is done. And you wanna measure and track your efficiencies of hours that are budgeted. What I was saying before, did we use the same amount of materials we called for and the right amount of labor time? That's a key, um, that's a key performance indicator that you need to drone, uh, drill down on. And you wanna get paid at the time of service. There is no reason in this day for accounts receivable. Everybody has credit cards. You set that expectation when you uh, schedule the job, you tell them what your terms of credit are that we get paid time of service and all the major credit cards that you have, you tell them that you have financing. So that is very important. That way they know there's no guesswork, you're not waiting for a check, you're not calling somebody at work that's on a conference call, and now you're burning minutes. So again, the foundation. George Washington said there is but one straight course, and that is to always seek the truth and pursue it steadily. And I believe in that completely. So this could be you. So the lab says he doesn't always get what he wants. Oh, yes, wait, I do. yes, I do. So thank you very much, John. I'll turn it back over to you so, and Mark. The bottom line is, guys and, and, and ladies, um, the, uh, the way to be successful in business is to live well below your means for many, many years. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I think you, was uh, you were talking, Chuck, and, uh, you know, as owner's intent, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a one truck operator. You know, uh, I know a lot of guys are very successful doing that. They love doing it. They're great technicians and they're just great operators. Um, and uh, we certainly bless you and honor you. And because there's many of, many of us that I started out that way. And, um, but then, you, but it all comes down to owner's intent. You have to figure out what you want and in Chuck's case, you know, he said, hey, I want to get off the truck. I want to manage a business. And also, you know, Chuck said a lot of things. And I know it's hard sometimes. Well, I don't, you know, it's kind of like we're, you're watching a half hour show on how to remodel a bathroom. But that doesn't mean you're going to be able to go remodel your bathroom. So you, you have to get some help. I, you know, in, in scaling my business the last 30 years or so, I've had to go get help because you don't learn a lot of this stuff in school. It's not like you can take a class in high school or you know, even college. I mean, uh, a lot of this stuff is just basically, it's more caught than it is taught. You have to hire people like Chuck or like Mark that, you know, have been there and done that. And the quickest way to success that I found is find out somebody that's a little farther ahead than you are and go find out what they know and, and ask them to help you. And, and um, you know, Chuck's got a lot of systems and he can help you set up your books and set up your metrics and everything. And that's kind of the first step. You have to know your numbers. Um, we get reports monthly and we, you know, spend days looking at them, making adjustments on our business. And, uh, and that's kind of where, you know, that's why I said that mindset of if you want to be a businessman, you have to change your mindset a little bit uh, to be a businessman. So I want to, I want to introduce uh, Mark Stoner and Mark. Um, sometimes he brings me to tears when he talks because he's, you know, he's, he went to uh, when I first met Mark, he was 
struggle a little bit. And uh, it's kind of like one of those things where the, the student becomes the teacher, you know, so, uh, but Mark has been, uh, just share, I want you to start by kind of sharing your story before we get into too much, Mark. And, you know, you, you had a great, you had a business, you didn't like it, you flush it down a toilet and you rebuild it. And then, uh, then a few years later, you're, you know, you're, you're doing a lot differently. And so, there's a mental gyration you have to go through and we just kind of share, start out with just kind of sharing that little bit of that story, Mark, if you would, and kind of how you got to kind of where you are now. Sure. I know a lot of people probably have heard it, but it's probably still relevant to those people who haven't heard it. Um, so for 17 years, I was a one truck operator. I did not know of CSIA very much. I knew about them, but I didn't really realize what the, um, you know, organization about NCSG and CSI were. So I was, I was kind of out there, on my own a lot uh, and learning and I thought I kind of knew you know what all I needed to know well uh, I started going to the national conventions and I started seeing that there was uh, all kinds of levels of businesses there not not too many big businesses but a lot of different knowledge and there was a lot of resources with those two organizations and I started becoming involved I got in the business in 1985 I did not become involved in the industry till 2001 I was certified in the early 90s and I let it lapse a couple of times. I really thought this industry was pretty much one truck operation. I couldn't really see how to get above one or maybe two trucks. I didn't really think that was possible with this type of business. So the more I attended, uh, you know, different events, the more I realized I could build it. And I started to build, I fell off a roof. I got hurt. I fell 30 feet off a roof, messed myself up uh, in 2003. And I decided to get out of the business. So in 2003, I realized one of the first things, and it's talked about a lot in the e-myth, that I had built myself a job. I, a one-man operation is basically a job. I did not have a business. I told everybody I had a business. I told, yeah, I, I'm in business, and people would call me an entrepreneur because I started a chimney business. Well, I realized both of those things were wrong. I did not really have a business in the true sense that a business can work without you. And I also was not an entrepreneur, really. I was a starter. I started a business. An entrepreneur is kind of a different mindset. Neither one of them are better or, or, or worse, but it's just different. If you, an entrepreneur has many different sources of income and many different things going on. So I learned a lesson that uh, I had built something really wrong because nobody wanted to build it or buy it. And then here's where it comes into today's topic. I then decided I wanted to really scale it. When I came back and I said, I'm gonna build this business, I'm gonna to have to have employees because it's too dangerous for me just to do this by myself and get hurt and then I'm out of business. So I started, I started hiring a lot of people. I started uh, you know, just going and, and building it. It's not really hard to add a few trucks. You can, pretty, you can do it kind of easily, but to have it like Chuck has it and it's very organized and all the methods that he just talked about like I'm not built that way. I'm not that guy at all. I can't, I can't, I have to hire people to help me with all that. I have a certain skill set that I'm good at. And then everything else for me have to be, I have to hire that. Well, at first I couldn't afford to hire anyone to do it. And I crashed the business in 2008. This is when I really met John Meredith. He just right before that I got to know him and then I crashed the business and I had 17 employees. It was like right at a million dollars, $1.1 million business. And I crashed it and had to go back to working by myself again. John came out with one of his products, Heat Shield product, and said, hey, I'd like you to be one of my test guys on this. I said, man, I can't afford a bucket of your material, let alone buy the winches and the cameras and all this. And, and John said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a hand up and I'm going to get you started in this. I think you can do something with it. So for that, John helped me get off the bottom. And, and really, I think that's what we're talking about here is if you scale, you, you need to scale and build it and then help somebody else build it. That's our, what our industry is really great at. But that's, and since, so since then, once I wrecked it and fixed it and John helped me get off the ground, you know, we took off and, and, and did a, a lot of the things that Chuck says in his thing took me a long time to build, a very long time. And I think it's taken Chuck a long time to build them too. He's telling you the whole map of what you need to do. But if you'll take his roadmap that he gave you and break it down and said, let's get this one done this month and this one done next month. And it takes years to do it, but it is the process of scaling. And then you stay, you know, it's business is tough, but it's 
uh, I, for me, I want to scale because it, it, I can handle more customers. I can give opportunities for other chimney sweeps and other people that want to learn our trade. And I personally don't want to do the work. You know, I'm now 53. I turned 53 yesterday. And, you know, I, I need to have a business that runs so I can do other things in my life, too. So that's a little bit of my story. John asked me to talk about five to seven topics but I, what I want to do is, if you're listening and you have questions, I told John I'd love to open this up for more questions than us talking. I'm going to run through a couple things, but I would hope if you have questions about anything I said or Chuck said or just it's, you know, it's one of our final uh, panels. So let's get some discussion going if you want, uh, and maybe we can help you answer some questions. But the very first thing you have to do is decide what is the plan. Um, that's that's your biggest hurdle what's the plan and a lot of times when people say i ask people that they say um well i don't know i want to add a truck or two i said well that's not really a plan that's as chuck said that's hoping for something the plan is what you want write it down do you want to add a truck a year for five years and you're going to be at five trucks in five years do you gotta want a truck every other year do you not want to add any trucks but in this case, I would think most people listening are, look, are going to talk about building the business. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So first of all, you need a plan. You need to write it down. You need to tell people about it. You need to especially tell your spouse or your partners. You need to tell anybody that's in business with you where we're going. Chuck mentioned a GPS, taking GPS across the country. Well, you got to plan it out and you got to tell people what you're going to do. And so there's all kinds of studies on written down plans versus uh, in your mind versus no plans and versus in your mind versus uh, written down. I think I've got the numbers here and I'll read them in a minute. But first thing starts with a plan. And then there's advantages and disadvantages with each any size business. Yes, I call it trading backaches for headaches, right? You're, when you're a one man operation, you get tired. You get really tired and um, you can get hurt, uh, your health can go south, uh, you can get sick, all kinds of things happen, but you have a lot less headaches overall. You're just responsible for yourself and you know you probably do great work. When you start training people, they're not gonna be as good as you, they're not gonna do things like you do, and they don't care as much as you do, honestly, and they're gonna fail you and they're gonna rip you off and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna lie to you and, and, and so, do you want, are you willing to trade one for the other? Now, ideally you build good people. You're gonna have to have bad people to learn how good the good people are. And then when you start building good people on good people, you build a culture that gets better and better. If you walked into my business today, you talk to my, the people that I have and I guarantee you're like, yeah, I could build a business on these people. These, these are good people. But it took me 100 people to get, you know, 60. It probably took me 300 people to get 60 good ones that we have now. But I'm willing to go through that. That's, that's the bottom line. Are you, do you want this? And how bad do you want it? And at what level do you is good for you? So pick the plan. One truck, three truck, five truck, 10 truck, 20 truck. And I still think we're small. I mean, I, we run 30 truck operation. And I really think we're still a small operation. I think there can be you can there can be hundred truck operations out there and there's a nine hundred truck HVAC operation in my town and there's another one that's seven hundred trucks. So for me to say thirty trucks to me doesn't sound big at all. I don't know if you guys were on the chimney chatter thing the other day where this guy decided that me and Chuck and John probably didn't have the expertise to to uh, host this call and it was pretty funny. But uh, you know, and I asked him, I said, hey, why don't you get on here and get on and help help us. If you've got some great answers that are better than ours, that's really what this industry is about, is help us to go from whatever level you want. And that's what I love about chimneys is that you can build whatever size business you want. So first thing is a plan. Second thing is an office or no office. A lot of people work out of their house. I found that when I worked out of my house, yes, I saved money, but when I, what started happening is I added trucks, my car started getting hit and backed into when guys were pulling in and out. Uh, I had a hard time getting UPS, I had deliveries and that kind of thing. So your, your house, if it's gonna be your office, has to really be set up for business. Um, if not, um, I moved into a small rental facility 
it, every single move for me was very scary. I moved from my house to a 1200 square foot facility to a 5,000 square foot facility. Now we're in a, a 25,000 square foot and a 5,000 square foot facility. So every move is tough, but you, um, I like having an office away from my house, but th again, this is the great thing about this industry. You can do what you want out of it. Also as a business owner, you need to switch your mindset like Chuck and, and John said to being a business owner. This last week we had Chris Springer and Chris Mason, Chris Mason, Chris Pryor come in and do masonry class at my business. It was, I love doing masonry. It was so tempting for me to get in there and start doing the mud and laying the brick because I love it. And those guys are great, but that's not the best place for me. I need to, it's the best place for my people to learn, but, me as a business person, if I'm going to do it, I need to stop with all the technical training and get more and more business training. And you need to get a mentor. And John said, you got to get somebody ahead of you and you got to get somebody beside you and you got to get somebody behind you and get those people in your life. And, and they all will help you scale this business to whatever level you want. To me, I've said this for years now, three trucks for me was the hardest it ever was, but I was in one of the trucks. Chuck, Chuck is a three truck operation and he's out of a truck. And that was a sweet spot for me when I got three to four trucks and I was out of it, the business started to roll and get more profitable. When I was got run one of the trucks, it was a nightmare. It was me. You know, if a guy called out, I had to do his work. Uh, if he messed up, I had to fix his stuff. If whatever the hardest work was, I had to do it because they didn't know how to do it. I had to order the materials. You know, I was just piling on, I had to write the checks for the guys. So the, the key, if you're going to run a business is to get out of a truck as fast as you can. Even if you want to start and you're never in a truck that you'll grow faster if you're never in a truck than if you are trying to get out of a truck, but also you develop expertise as a technician and you, and that's how you build your business too. Number three, you must write down the plan. I should have probably had this number two, but the plan has to be written down. I was going to give you these stats. Um, it's a Harvard study several years ago. It says 83% of the population has no goals. 14% have a plan in mind and 3% actually have them written down. The study said that just having them in mind, you were 10 times more like more success. They were 10 times more successful than those with no goals at all. And I have to tell you, most chimney guys I talk to have zero goals. The goal is just to go work as hard as you can and make as much money as you can. That's like the goal. So if you just have it in your mind, I'm saying in your mind, I'm going to be a 10 truck operation. Just that in your mind, you're 10 times more, more likely to be successful than those without it. But then here's the other one. The 3% that had it written down, written down were three times more likely than those who just had them in mind. So, you're, you're almost 300 times more likely to be successful if you write them down than somebody that has no goals. If you have no goals, you, you're just going to land on, it just doesn't work that way. I can promise you Chuck has goals like crazy. John Meredith has goals like crazy. We have goals like crazy. We write them down. We tell everybody in the company the goals. I promise you if there's one thing you're going to take away from this, this call is the goal setting. You've heard it your whole life, but if you haven't done it, you're messing up. And if you have done it, you'll know how valuable that information I just told you is. You reckon you have a good book or anything that you recommend that somebody could read uh, on that topic or uh, goal setting. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Again, I, one of the things is not really a goal setting book that I like a lot is the five dysfunctions of a team. And that's not really goal setting, but it helps you you can build a great goal. And if you don't have anybody around you following you, it's really hard. And if you're not a good leader, then you're like, why build a goal? Cause the guy quits me every other year or, or I can't build a team. So build the leadership first and the goals can be whatever. I, a simple goal I think is add a truck a year, or add a truck every two years. And when you do that, what's that look like? If I add a truck, do I have parking for it? Do I have money for it? And then do I have to get another apprentice to go under that and build out your organizational chart, you know, how you want it in 
year 2020, year 2021, build that out, put people in them or X's in them and build out what you want this company to look like. When I have people come through what's called Blue Collar University, I bring them in, I show them how we do everything. And on the second day, we build out an org chart with a five-year game plan. Well, it's really interesting as you start building that out, how kind of scary people think about it, but it also stretches their brain to what their business is going to look like if you write it down. It's so critical to, to just write that down. So as far as a book, I've, I've read probably 800 books at this point, but I can't think of a true goal setting book that I really got a lot out of. It's, it's kind of what you want in life, really. Next. When you build this organizational chart out, one of the first things you should do is assign leaders or lead technicians. I used to have me at the top and then 17 people underneath me. And I had an org chart that was one and 17. I think if anybody knows anything about org charts knows that was a nightmare for me. If you are running a business and everybody answers to you, it gets very difficult when you scale very big. So the first thing you do is let's just say you have a sweep operation, you have a masonry crew, you have say a gas division, and probably all those are all those guys are doing the same things and maybe and maybe crossing over and doing stuff. But basically you wanna you wanna assign a leader to each each division and he's the one that everybody answers to, if that makes sense. Next, um, let's see here. So one thing is to become um, the, a better, the better leader, the best leader you can become. The reason that's important, and you can look around and know if you're a good leader. If, any, if nobody's following, you're not a good leader. So it's a pretty easy litmus test. If nobody's following, you're not a leader. You may want to be a leader. The other thing is, is how many people are following you. So let's just say you say, hey, I can only get a guy to work for me for a year or two, and then he's, and then he's gone. The best thing you can do is a is an exit interview with people that are leaving and you learn so much about what's wrong with your company on an exit interview and when people are leaving i try to do an exit interview because that's when they'll tell you the real truth i mean you will you will hear so many things you didn't want to hear from an exit interview you'll hear people that are doing you wrong you'll hear people you'll they'll tell you what's wrong with you they'll tell you what's wrong with your company and you have to decide if that's right or not but I can tell you, I fixed a lot of things on an exit interview. And that's how you, in fact, I've saved a relationship too on an exit interview. Somebody really misunderstood something in our system. He exited, but he came back a couple months later because he exited on a really good way, uh, in a way that I did bring him back. Uh, somebody just put up Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. That's, that is a good book. Uh, but exit interviews, again, leadership, I've probably read the most books on leadership, because if you can't lead anybody, it's really hard to scale this business. Last couple things, and then we can open up for um, talks. Backing up, starting over, and failure are all part of success. They are not the opposite of success. Don't be afraid of failure. It, it's part of the pie. It's part of, as Chuck said, the cake mix. In that mix, you would never think of failure, but I have several businesses. One of them is a chocolate business. We fail on a daily basis trying to come up with a new recipe, a new method, a new thing. In the chimney business, we have failures daily on communication, on a new system we may have put in place, a new employee. He's going to fail. A new person didn't do something right. Failure is absolutely not the opposite of success. In fact, the more successful a person you see, probably the more failures they have gone through. I, at any level, they're probably the big, the bigger they are, the bigger failures they have had. And I've had to learn to be okay with failures. I don't want to do them over and over, obviously. You, you know, you want to fail but learn something new from it. But I go into anything now knowing there's going to be failures and we're just going to work through them, not afraid of the failures. Um, training and education is probably the best thing to help you sleep at night. Um, training and education will build more um, morale in your company. It will build something to shoot for in your company. Um, if you get called up on a lawsuit, you've got you've trained your people to be um, to have the net, you know, the certifications and train them well. If you don't train them and they do something wrong, there could be neglect, 
There could be negligence in there. So the best thing uh, that you can do to sleep at night is training, 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 education, education, and then testing them on that education. And the last thing really I have before we can open it up, I know we got about 10 or 15 or 20 more minutes, but is that business is hard. Um, I'm not here to tell you this is easy and I'm not telling you that uh, anything that maybe successes that anybody else has had is gonna be successful for you. I know there's people that should not scale and grow a business. And I know there's a lot of people that have a ton of potential and this industry needs you to do it. The reason I think this topic is so important is because we need businesses to scale in this industry to service more customers, to establish us as more of a professional trade that people know, to, um, to keep people safe. And you know how it is. Our biggest problem right now is not necessarily wood burning creosote. It's construction defects, people that don't know what they're doing, fixing chimneys and installing them, causing potential issues. And it's our job as an industry to get people out there that do know the codes, that do know how to build businesses, that can help people and uh, keep people safe and ideally build the lifestyle that you want. Uh, this business I think is, is amazing, yet yeah, it's one of probably the hardest businesses you could do. So if you're gonna scale it, uh, reach out and help people, reach out and ask people questions and there's a lot of, the, the answers are all out there. I think that's you know, that's one of the things I always tell people that one of the things I love about this industry is it's, I call it a culture of honor. Yeah. You know, and it kind of goes back and I think I wrote about, I've written about this. Some of you have heard me say this, but, you know, years ago, Bob Daniels kind of set the tone for this industry. He was president of Copperfield Chimney Supply. And, you know, he just basically told us, you know, we were a bunch of guys sitting around. He said, well, here's how you answer the phone. Here's how you sell a chimney cap. And, you know, so he honored us by kind of building into us. And then so um, a, a lot of us honored, you know, Copperfield by, you know, with the lion's share of our business. And the, uh, one of the things that um, is, it was, but that set a tone in our industry as a culture of honor. So I think it's a very unique business in the sense that if you want help, there are people that are willing to help you because, you know, what you can only give what you've been given. And so I feel like, you know, so many of us have been so lucky to, there's, we've been given so much by our peers that there's a real culture to give back in this industry. And I, you know, I have a couple of friends, one's a billionaire and, and then another friend of mine, Brian Kaur. And, you know, one of the things I noticed about them, and they all started with nothing, is that they are very introspective. So if you said, hey, I think you're kind of an idiot, they'd say, well, they, instead of blowing it off, putting their defenses up, they'd say, wait a minute, you know, am I an idiot? <laughs> and they'd go get, you know, they talk to people that they trusted, you know, you know, or in fact, one case when Clay Matil told me, he said, you know, I was very controlling and um, people didn't like that. So it, was, it, helped, it helped. So once people would say, you know, hey, you're kind of controlling and he'd go to somebody and say, well, you know, am I controlling? And your wife said, yeah, you're kind of controlling. <laughs> he'd go, go to his, you know, well, co-workers. And so he, he fixed that. So, I mean, we, so, but you have to be open-minded enough to fix yourself before you can fix your team or fix, you know, I think that's where a lot of us, you know, we know the right way and it's our way. And, you know, and those people never really achieve the level of success that they want to achieve because they're not open to changing themselves. And I think that's the, the big part of this is you've got to be willing to think differently and you've got to put people around you to think differently if you you know and kind of bend where you're wanting to go you got to go through the fire um if you're going to change as a leader and get a lot of people around you it gets tough when they tell you the hard truth and in that book five dysfunctions of a team one of them is is you know that hard real talk between each other and if you don't have that in your business in fact i, I was starting to have that in my business i had some senior level people that the other people below them felt like they could not talk to them because they were afraid of retribution. They were afraid of, uh, you know, the person just being mad at them. And uh, I, in this last month, went through the company and broke that all down. When I saw that really affecting communication inside the company where people can't tell each other the truth, good or bad, um, it really starts to mess up your company. So 
if you're that person, you're the leader that people can't talk to, it's a real limiting factor. And um, you got to make sure that people have the freedom to tell you if they care about you, they'll tell you the truth. If they don't care about you, they'll just skip it and not tell you anything. So make sure you have a, a, a culture that will let people tell you the truth and you accept that and listen to it and figure out, hey, how can I be better at this? Because I promise you, you're not a finished work of art underneath museum glass and you're completed at this point either. So don't ever think that. Understand that you, you can get better too and that we all can. And this industry is really young. It's still very young. I think we're on the precipice of another generational jump for this industry. Uh, Chuck has done a great job of moving our industry forward with the manual and the structures and, and everything we're putting in place. So, and we're trying to really do more business training so that you have those answers to grow it. But don't just try to go out there and figure it all out yourself. Like Chuck said, get answers from people that are ahead of you that you respect and that you can help you every time you talk to somebody they uh, they can help you. You learn from everybody. Yeah, I think that's that's paramount. You know, one of the things you talked about earlier was planning. And I can tell you, so one of the things I learned from my friend Brian Corr, who's actually going to be speaking at one of my events in January. Um, and Brian is kind of a Zen master of strategic planning. In our business, in our industry, we've not really talked about that much. But this guy takes it to a whole nother level. And I can tell you when when Brian took me through his strategic planning process, we started and, and, and we built out the plan. Um, you know, our business started to grow by, you know, double digits. So it's very important, to, you know, to have a, a good strategic plan in place and, uh, and know how to execute it. That's one of the things that I've seen, you know, that, that, you know, Clay Mateel, I talk about sometimes he took, he bought Imesman's half million to grow it to a billion put a couple hundred million back on the table and build Aileron in Dayton where I've held some events. But that's a great place to go get help because uh, Aileron has a course for presidents and then they connect you with a business advisor and that business advisor, so they kind of do an assessment of your business, say, here, here's where you start. They give you a roadmap, they give you a plan and they, and they, and they deliver the resources that you need to build out that plan. So that'd be a great place to start if you want to scale. It was aileron.org. Um, I'll give you an example too. Same, same idea, getting mentors to help you. The other day I got called from a person that, said, that I knew and he said, Hey, I'm getting ready to, I want to, I'm scared to move my business into a bigger building. Right now I pay $700 in rent and I've got, I split a 2,500 square foot facility and I'm really outgrowing it. But the next thing available is $3,500 a month. And I said, and he said, it's really scary for me to jump into that, especially with the unknown times of day. And this guy does know his numbers. He's good. But I said, you know, there's a couple ways to structure that deal. If it's $3,500 a month, maybe you could say, hey, year one with everything un unknown, can we move it to like 2,800 a month, year two, 3,500 and year three, 4,200 and give yourself some time to structure that deal and get into the buildings like, ah, oh, I never thought of that. Other thing is how you do the terms of the lease. Who's responsible for the roof, the HVAC, the parking lot? Like, that's the kind of stuff that a mentor can help you with before you move to the next step. Just a quick phone call with somebody who knows something. I can tell you for sure. I, and then I said, hey, how many chimney sweeps do you do in a year? Blah, blah, blah. I said, gosh, all you have to do is probably add 5% to your overall total and you will make up that rent no matter what. Just and Chuck is really good at this. How do you break it down to the little thing? If you want to make a move, how do you make the move? That's a strategic plan. How do we do it? What do we need to do? What do we need to raise our prices to? Another thing, you're killing yourself probably going to Home Depot and Brickyards. I promise you, if you got guys going to Home Depot, oh, uh, my battery's getting low. If you got guys going to Home Depot and, and Brickyards, you're losing hundreds or thousands of dollars a month. Have that stuff dropped off at your shop. Have it dropped off at the job site. Don't have send a two man crew to Home Depot to pick up caulk. I mean, you're you're. I mean, it's just those kind of things. There's a, there's death by a thousand paper cuts. You know, uh, stop all those little things. If you want twenty percent profit in this business, most people are at five to seven percent profit in this business. To get to twenty percent, you need to take about a half a percent or one percent away from about ten other categories, <laughs> and waste is a big one. Mr. Wakes was. That's very doable. 
Mr. Waste was my highest paid employee for a long time. He's probably <laughs> your highest paid employee too. You need to cut that dude's yeah. salary. Mr. Waste. <laughs> cut his salary. I love it. Yeah. We got, um, Chuck, you've been quiet over there. You got any, you got any thoughts along the way here you want to share? Yeah, yeah, I could talk all night, as you know. I like to talk. But, yeah, everything Mark is saying is obviously correct. And it goes back to what I was saying. You've got to boil down to what is it costing you per minute. And if you out. So I used to have a scenario where when we would do large jobs and a guy was going to be on a job site all day, I would take him lunch. And a lot of people thought I was nuts for doing that. So there was a reason behind it. And it was efficiency. So it was a way for me to get out of the office, stretch my legs. I could see that they were following all of our protocols, our safety procedures, and how I wanted my job set up. Number two, I would buy them and bring them lunch. And it might cost me 20 or 25 $30 at the time to do that. And they thought it was great. Somebody brought them free lunch. And then I could break with them, take them 10 or 15 minutes, they'd eat the lunch. We'd have a little bit of talk back and forth, how the job's going. And then they were back on the job site. Conversely, if I didn't spend that $25, I would have two or three men leaving for 45 minutes to an hour going to McDonald's. I mean, think about it. You can leave your office right now in downtown Richmond, drive about four blocks up to the closest McDonald's, as I remember. And by the time you ordered, got through the line, got back to your office, you would burn up 30 to 45 minutes. What is that costing you per hour? And now you took you know, two secretaries with you, what is that doing for your efficiency? So that's what Mark's talking about, sending a truck to Home Depot. And I bet you every time they went in to buy two tubes of caulk, they also saw they needed a, a new yeah. saw blade or a drill bit or something new else. So all, they're, so, and, yeah. then they'll, and then I'll wrap it up without being, so if you go in our area, they're nationwide, as far as I know, we have a big HVAC contractor called uh, RE Michaels or a supply warehouse. They have ice machines, free coffee, free ice, and free donuts. You know why they do that? Because your employees <laughs> will go there for free instead of going to 7-Eleven. And the little bit that that costs them in donuts and ice, man, they're getting new wrenches they don't need and extra <laughs> bottles of this and that. And, I mean, they're just taking you to the cleaners. Yep. So, you know, my system, I'm not as sophisticated as Mark. Mark has a vendor come in and actually fill Coke-type machines that you have to punch in a code and buy your materials from, and then he tracks it. He's at a huge level. I do all the shopping in my off time because that's what I like to do. You could hire somebody to do that for you, and it's only one person. But I'm only buying what I need, and I'm only keeping the inventory, and I have a tight control over it. So know what you need to charge per minute, and it will scare you when you start finding out what five minutes of wasted time costs per man. Yeah, yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've gone out in the field to work with guys and, you know, they've run two or three times to the, you know, to the store, you know, oh, they need a tube of caulk or they need, you know, something, some bolts or screws or something. It's just, it's just, there's a lot of inefficiencies that can build into a system if you allow it. So just kind of, yeah. so I just want to uh, thank everyone for being here today. I think, you know, one of the things I will share with you is that, um, don't be afraid to get help. Don't be afraid to hire consultants. The most successful businesses, you know, Mark talking about the Harvard, Harvard Business Review about planning. You know, the other thing is I will tell you the most successful businesses always, you know, are not afraid to hire consultants or get help. So you've got to, uh, you've got to find the right people to help you. And I think these are two great ones right here. So I wouldn't, I would not hesitate to reach out to them, but it all me, starts with, go ahead, Mark. I just add one more thing. I still spend a ton of money every year on, on mentors myself. I spend, uh, I find guys and people that are ahead of me, groups that are ahead of me and spend a lot of money on business education, wherever I can get it. I, I this isn't really a plug, but I can tell you this, uh, me and, and Chuck and a couple other people, spark marketer and Kent Wesley, who works for me for hiring. We're going to be in New Hampshire at doing the business symposium for the CSIA. Uh, at John Caesar's place, I believe is where it is. And, uh, you know, if you need business training, we're going to be talking two days of everything you need. Whatever it is, you never, I, I never lose money investing in education. I, it always pays back somewhere. And go to the conventions. I mean, you know, I, yep. used to, I, used to, I mean, I always came back from the conventions with an idea that was worth 
10 times or 20 times more than what I paid to be at the convention. So, yeah. you know, don't look at it as, as an expense because it's an, it's an investment. But you, the things where I got the most value was always, you know, a lot of times just talking to the guys in the hallway, you know, asking them questions. How are you doing this? What are you doing with that? And just getting multiple opinions. And uh, so what, uh, when is the symposium in New Hampshire, by the way, Mark? Go ahead. It's going to be August 1st. Um, August 1st and 2nd, which is uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, if you want information about it, you can go to CSIA.org. You can register there. Definitely worth the price of admission. As Mark said, we're going to have business classes. We're going to be talking about marketing, how to build your business, how to make money off of being safe in your business, all kinds of really good stuff. We had the uh, kickoff for our business symposium at our tech center in January this year. It was well attended and a lot of people came away with some very good information, not being self-serving because Mark and I were part of the panel, but there's just good bare bones information that you can walk out the door and implement when you get into uh, work on Monday morning. And that's the biggest thing is not just hear this stuff, you gotta pick two or three things and write it down and implement it. Yeah. And you got to, you know, it, it, you, the most successful people I know, they have a bias toward action. So <laughs> I remember yeah. uh, uh, one of my friends, uh, Steve Blackburn, who yep. uh, was an amazing, I mean, you, you'd have a conversation with that guy. And the next thing I, you know, I get a call from him like a week later, he says, Hey, I tried what you did and it, and it really worked well. <laughs> I said, what did I say? You know, I, yeah. but you know, he, he was like, he would just implement, implement, implement. And he, he would fail, he would fail, he'd fail, but you know, and then he would, not you know, but if you if you think about it, you know, you know, but then he would be he would find the nuggets of success in there, and he just kept was relentless about taking action. I think that's what always impressed me about Steve. Um, Steve passed away a few years. I still think about him pretty regularly, but Steve, uh, you know, was one of the best implementers I know. And so, so you've got to take a bias toward action. You got to get clarity around what you want, and then you got to get some help. And you can do this. I mean, we have a great profession. We're helping people. We're making the you know the country safer. You deserve to make a lot of money in this business, and you deserve you know to uh, to, to reach whatever level of success that you want in this business. And so, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chuck. And and uh, thanks everyone for being on the call today. It's been a great call, and I think we've all uh, learned a lot. Again, I want to emphasize: go back and listen to some of the previous webinars we've had because those will all help you as well. There's great. You can listen to those in your truck while you're driving around. Um, lots of good information and, uh, you know, Chuck, you want to take it over from here and we'll, uh, I think we're going to put this on pause for a little while, but, uh, we'll probably be back and, uh, you know, we just we hope everybody has a great, safe and profitable busy season. Thank you, John. All right. Well, thank you, John and Mark, uh, for providing, uh, some really excellent content for us today. Uh, that's really important to the credential holders and the members of the NCSG. Uh, CSI and NCSG are committed to providing real ROI for our industry family because we believe we are a family and we need to protect each other. Um, we've presented about 10 different topics to assist you in surviving and now thriving in this uh, new normal, as we're calling it, in a business climate. Um, as John said, we're going to take a breather for a little bit and we're going to have more panel discussions in the future. You're going to be emailed something shortly, uh, a questionnaire to fill out. We not only want to know what kind of job we did and how we did, we want to know other things that you want to hear about in the future so we can prepare that content for you because we want to be relevant and we want to help. Uh, it's been our honor to serve you. Jasper and I sincerely thank you for the privilege of being your presidents. Uh, I want you to remember that CSIA and, and NCSG are the future of this industry. We are both nonprofits working for you. This is not a per profit business. So we are only here to help and make this industry better and you as an individual member or credential holder. And uh, we will all rise and prosper together if we work together. So please be safe out there and thank you very much for your participation. Have a good evening. See you guys. See y'all.